Hi guys, we're starting chapter 4, and chapter 4, section 1, is properties of linear functions and linear models. Now you've done linear equations before, and we said that there were several different ways that we could write our linear equations. We can write them in slope-intercept form, or point-slope form, or in general form. However, when we're talking about linear functions, we want to isolate the y. So we already have what we know as slope-intercept form. We're going to place, replace the y with f of x. And so here we have this linear function, and you should already know what parts of these are. The m stands for the slope, and the b stands for the y-intercept. The domain of a linear function is going to be the set of all real numbers. You could write the words all real numbers, or you could just say the interval that goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. Now when we talk about increasing constant and decreasing functions, we're talking about going from left to right on that function on the x-axis. So I've already labeled these as increasing constant and decreasing. I just want to say that it's increasing when the slope is positive. It's constant when the slope is zero, and it's decreasing when the slope is negative. We're going to dive right into doing some work. For number one, it's asking us to identify certain pieces. The slope is the coefficient of the x, or negative two-thirds, and the y-intercept is a constant, four. Make sure you're not putting negative two-thirds x. It's just the negative two-thirds, not including the x. Um, one of the ways I like to write this is I like to drag that negative into the numerator so that I can know if it's going up or down. Okay, it says to use the slope and the y-intercept to graph the function. So I'm going to go to this graph we have on the right-hand side, and I'm going to put the y-intercept on the 4. Now it says down 2 over 3. And the, the bottom will always go from left to right unless we have a negative sign on it. I'm going to count down 2 and then over 3. I'm going to count down 2 and over 3. And I'm going to, for good measure, I'm going to do it one more time. Now I said... Um, you could also take that negative and say positive 2, negative 3. What does that mean? Well, that means you count up, and then you go back 3. So starting over at the 4, I'm going to go up, and then back 3. Up 2, over 3. Up 2, over 3. And I encourage you to do it for the width and length of the graph that you have. And then you're going to connect it with a line. You want to make sure that your line goes from edge to edge of the graph. You can also make sure that you put arrows on end to signify that it's actually going from negative infinity to positive infinity on the x-axis. If you draw it too short, people will think you're drawing a line segment and not a line. All right. Then now part C says to determine if this function is increasing, decreasing, or constant. There are two different ways I can do part C. One is just by looking at the slope. And because the slope is negative, I should know that it's decreasing. But since I already graphed it, I could also just look at the graph, and from left to right, you could see that the graph is going down. So therefore, it's decreasing. Um, I erased the graph to give us room to do part B of question 1. Now, when you're looking at this equation, it might not be evident that it's written in slope-intercept form. But if I were to rewrite it, this is what I would get. My slope here is 0 then my y-intercept is 2. So uh, if I wanted to graph this, I'm going to use the 2 to come over here. And then I'm just going to say um, the slope is 0. It doesn't go up or down. It just goes left to right. So you can just put dots on all of this. You don't have to, but you can get an idea of what you're going to graph. All right, let me graph it real quick. So there we have the graph of it. Notice how my graph goes from edge to edge. Uh, my line goes all the way to the end so that um, you're not looking at just a little tiny line segment, but you're looking at a line. Um, now, based off of the slope, I can tell you that my slope being 0 tells me that this is a constant graph. But also, if you look at the graph, you can tell it's not going up, it's not going down. So it's constant. So for question number 2, it's asking us to... Uh, imagine two graphs. We're going to focus first on f of x. It asks us to graph both of them, but we're going to graph f of x in orange. 
Our y-intercept is 3, so I'm going to put a 3 here. Um, and then we know the slope is 2. In other words, up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1. And remember that when I say the slope is 2 over 1, that's the same thing as negative 2 over negative 1, which is going to be down 2 and left 1. So coming from here, I'm going to go down 2, left 1, down 2, left 1, down 2, left 1. And you want to make sure your dots go th from edge to edge, so that when you connect them, your line doesn't go crooked. And if your line is a little wobbly, that's okay, as long as it's straight in terms of it goes, it hits all the dots that you've drawn. We're going to uh, draw, we're going to graph g of x in blue, and we're going to go to our y-intercept of 8. We're going to go a slope is negative 1 half. And I said you can either graph that as negative 1 over 2, which means it's down 1 to the right 2. Let's do that one first. So we're going to go down 1 to the right 2, down 1, right 2, down 1, right 2, and you can keep on going until we get to the edge. And then, like I said before, we could do um, positive 1 over negative 2, which means to go up, and then you go left 2. So from the 8, we're going to go up 1, left 2, up 1, left 2, and then connect all your dots. So I have both of these graphed. Um, now each line is uh, all the solutions to each of these equations that we have written, but the only one that is a solution to both of them being equal to each other is the point where they intersect, um, and that is at 2, 7. All right, so we've done all of part A, and it says solve f of x is less than 0. And when we say f of x, we mean y, the y value. So we're looking at the y value, which is f of x, and we want the y to be less than 0. So this question is actually, is actually asking for what values of x is y less than 0. And if you look at this graph, we can see that the y values are less than 0 on this portion of the graph, meaning our answer is going to be what values of x are here in this interval. Now, it sort of crosses the x-axis not at a nice point, so we're going to actually solve for that algebraically. Let me erase what I have here. Notice that I can replace the f of x with what f of x is equal to. In other words, I can replace it with a 2x plus 3. And so I can say, when is 2x plus 3 less than 0? For what values of x? So I would solve this, and I say 2x is less than negative 3, and x is less than negative 3 halves. In other words, from negative infinity to negative 3 halves. At through negative 3 halves, is it less than 0? We're not going to include that point, we're just going to use parentheses, and what I have written in the parentheses is similar to that line, the yellow line that I drew on the x-axis. Right? We have, for these x values, it's less than, the y values is less than 0. Now we have a different question for part c, and part c says, when is f of x greater than g of x? Now, visually speaking, we can look at this graph and say that answer is here. We can see that this graph that I'm highlighting in yellow is greater than the blue graph below it. So for what values of x is this true? It's for all the values of x that are greater than 2. But let's go ahead and solve that algebraically again. Let's see what that looks like. I would replace f of x with 2x plus 3. I'm going to replace g of x with negative 1 half x plus 8. I'm going to get 2 and a half x is greater than or equal to 5. And I'm just going to rewrite my 2 and a half x as 5 over 2x. So when I solve this, I'm going to divide both sides by 5 over 2. I'm going to multiply by 2 fifths. And so I'm going to say multiply by 2 fifths. And so I'm going to get x is greater than or equal to 2. 
And so we can see that that's, that interval um, where my f of x is greater. So I'm going to say from 2 on. Um, how would I write this algebraically? I would say 2 to infinity, including the 2, because that they are equal to itself over there. And there we go. Now, question number three asks us to determine whether the given function is linear or nonlinear. And if it's linear, we want to find the equation. It says to use the average rate of change. So we're going to look at the change in x's first. And the difference between the x's is that we're going to be adding one each time. And you can see that each value of x is added one. Now let's look at the change in y. And the change in y is 0.5. And if we check it, it's constant. It's always going to be 0.5. And so we can see that that change is constant. And because it is, we know, therefore, it's linear. Um, the slope is going to be the change in y over the change in x, meaning the 0 0.5 over the 1. Let's write that in a better way. Let's multiply both of these by 2. So we'll call it 1 half. All right. And well, the y-intercept was given to us right around here. So I know that the y-intercept is negative 3. So putting the information together, I can say y is equal to 1 half x minus 3. However, it does say um, we are in the functions, so we should, instead of calling it y, we should call it f of x. In question 4, we're asked about quantity supplied and quantity demanded. So we have our supply and demand equations, S and D, and there's some stuff that they haven't told you, like what does it mean to have an equilibrium price? Well, first of all, let's determine that P right over here, it's told to us, P happens to be our variable in the equations, and it is the price of a hot dog. So when they ask you to find the equilibrium price, they want you to find P. Later on, they ask you to find equilibrium quantity. That is like saying S of P. But what they don't tell you is that equilibrium is when my supply and my demand are the same thing. So basically you're saying, when is my supply the same as my demand? And so when we're setting it up, if to find equilibrium price, you're going to say, when is my supply equal to demand? You're going to replace those with the equations in question. So that would be negative 2,000. And you're going to make that... Um, plus 3,000p, we're going to add, make that equal to 10,000 minus 1,000p. And when I solve this, I'm going to add 1,000 to both sides, and I'm going to add 2,000 to both sides, and I'm going to divide by 4,000, and I'm going to get p equals 3. And so we can see that the equilibrium price is $3. Because, like I said, we solved for P, so that's what we were finding here. It does ask us to find the equilibrium quantity. You might wonder, how do I find a quantity? Well, the quantity is in the functions S and D, so we're going to plug our price, our $3, into each of these functions. So if I get S of 3, I should get negative 2,000 plus... 9,000, and that would give me a 7,000. When I plug that into the demand equation, I'm going to get um, 10,000 minus 3,000. So also, I get the same answer, which makes sense because I said equilibrium is when my S is equal to D. So my supply and my demand are the same when the price is set at 3. The quantity would be 7,000 hot dogs. Now we're not done with this question. Um, we've only solved part A. 
But part B says determine the prices for which quantity demanded is less than quantity supplied. And for that, I actually want to reference us to the graph of it. It asks us to compare the demand to the supply. And it says, when is our demand less than our supply? Now, what's confusing sometimes is, are we talking about the function D and S, or are we talking about the supply, or the price, P? And even though we're comparing the demand to the supply, what we're actually asking is, when does this comparison happen, or what value of P? So I'm going to solve this graphically first. And if we look at the graph, the equilibrium point is, happens when the price is 3. And if we look at the supply and the demand, the demand is less than the supply on the right side of the line. So for values of P that are greater than 3, this is going to be true. Now, so we're saying the demand is less than the supply when the price increases or when the price is greater than 3. Now let's solve this algebraically. Um, I would go over here to our equation and we would replace each equation with what they are equal to. And notice that when we do that, we now have an inequality in P. And so um, if I get negative 4,000, P is less than negative 12,000, and I divide by negative 4,000, my, um, my inequality will switch sides. You can see that I'm going to get the same answer here that I got by looking at the graph. And whenever my, when my price is greater than 3, then my demand is going to be less than my supply. We can answer part C by looking at our answers to part B. And it says, what do you think will happen to the price of hot dogs if the quantity demanded is less than the quantity supplied? And we can see that when the quantity d demanded is less than the quantity supplied, the price here, we can see, goes up. So we know that the price will increase if the quantity demanded is less than the quantity supplied. And so that's all of our answers for question number four. Number five is another question that might include some, um, some concepts that you might not be familiar with. Um, it, it's once again coming from business practices. It says, suppose that a company has just purchased a new machine for its manufacturing facility for $120,000. The company chooses to depreciate the machine using the straight line method over 10 years. Now, the clue here is that they're saying the straight line method. And that straight line method means that we're going to use a linear model. But we're not really given a lot of information here. And how are we going to write the linear model? One of the things we want to do first is write down the information we know. Um, we're depreciating the machine over amount of time. So we know that we have the price or um, the cost of the machine at the time we purchase it. So at zero years, the price is going to be $120,000. And we know that after 10 years pass, we want the whole thing to be depreciated. So it's not going to be worth anything at all. Um, if I were to do slope, um, I would get 120,000, I should say, minus 0 over 0 minus 10. And we would get 120,000 over negative 10, which gives me negative 12,000. So that's going to be my slope of my function. And I also know the y-intercept because at the first year, this is its price. So combining that information, I'm going to be able to say its value comparing to its age is going to be negative 12,000 x plus 120,000. Once again, where am I getting this concept from? Um, the age was over here, and then its value was on this side. And we use that as our x and our y values to find our slope, and then to put that into our function. Part B asks us, what is the implied domain of the function found in part A? What kind of values can we have when we're talking about the age? Well, we can't really have negative 
values. Um, so we're thinking the, dom the domain of the function would be all the x values where x is greater than or equal to 0. That's the way you write it algebraically and in set notation. You could also say the domain is the positive values. That's in interval notation. Now, we probably wouldn't go all the way to infinity because we just can't get that far. But the implied domain is positive and zeros. And they want us to graph the function now. So once again, I'm going to take this function and graph it in Desmos. So we're looking at the graph here. I just want to point out that we said the domain starts at 0. So in reality, if I were to graph it, um, this is really the domain of the graph. It's not from 0 to infinity. And I made a mistake a little bit earlier because the domain is only when um, for, for the 10 years that it's running. So my domain would be from when we get it to when it depreciates. We're only looking at that because it's not going to have negative values um, and it's not going to have a negative age. So you could also say that is x for the values of 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 10. And there's our two different notations for our domain. All right. Now looking at the graph, um, it makes sense that straight line depreciation, it starts at the very beginning. At zero years old, it's going to be 120,000. And at after 10 years, it's going to be valued at zero. That's exactly what the word problem told us. To be able to do part D, which asks us, what is the book value of the machine after eight years? We're going to say the value at 8 years is going to be um, negative 12,000 times 8 plus 120,000, which is going to be negative 96,000 plus 120,000. And so that gives us 24,000. So the value of the machine at 8 years is 24,000. You always have to make sure you use the right units. We can see that on the graph that the value is right around here. Now we wouldn't have been able to come up with the exact answer, but it makes sense that we say at 8 years the machine is 24,000 um, in value. Now notice when it says, what is the book value of the machine after 8 years? Because it's asking the question 8 years, I'm plugging 8 in for the variable, because the variable is capturing my years. But the next question asks us something different. It asks us, when does a machine have a book value of 72,000? Now that's a different question, it's asking the y value. Um, and it's asking us to find the x. So we're going to take this and we're going to plug in our equation. We get negative 12,000x plus 120,000 equal to 72,000. We're going to subtract 120,000 from both sides. And then we're going to divide both sides by negative 12,000 and we're going to get 4. And so if we look at this over here, does it make sense that we get 4 72,000. And that should make sense to us over here. But notice that for question, the, for the first question, it was plug in 8 for the value of x. And the next question was plug in 72,000 for the value of the whole equation and then find x. So they're opposite questions, and we solve them in opposite manners. Uh, make sure that when you're taking an equation, you know what the variables stand for and you know what the questions are asking you to solve for. That helps you set it up properly. And that is all of section 4.1.